It's really, really fun. So We Are Loved was the, the, uh, the title of the song that we just heard. And that's really what it's all about this morning. But I want to hear from you a little bit. Um, we're going to have some interactive time here. I would love to know or to hear from some of you, how are you loved by God? Anybody want to want to answer that? If you do, you're going to get one of these super cool, stylish, we are loved shirts. Yes, Rebecca, how are you loved by God? His, by His mercy and His grace. Okay, this is extra large. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> That's all we have, I think. Or lar- I think we have love. So I have a lot more. Who, how are you loved by God? Yes. Uh, there you go. All right. How are you loved by God? Awesome community that He surrounded you with. That's awesome. Yes? Uh, Nina? Chance to be in relationship with him. Awesome. Back there, red hat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no shirt stealing. This is church after all. Yes. Yes, he did. That's right. Whoa. Oops. I'm sorry, ma'am. <laughs> well, I do this, this frequently. I don't know if you were at our memorial service outside when I kicked the ball right into a lady's face. Off the, that was... It was not good. It was not good. Yes. How are you loved by God? Lots of forgiveness. Yes, absolutely. I've got four more. Four more people loved by God. Yes. Gives you strength every day. It's awesome. And that was right on. Yes, Vinny. Get. I couldn't hear. You. The gifts he's given you. Yes. One of them is your wife next to you. Right. Undeservedly so. <laughs> Yes, his faithfulness, absolutely. And then all the way back, yes. Work, yes, that's a gift from God. Here we go. Let's see if I can do that. Everybody get out of the way. Oh, Bob, Bob got it. All right. We are loved. And yes, we are. We are loved. You know, that's really what the whole message is about today. That's why I'm wearing this t-shirt. We are loved. We are loved by God more than we can understand and more than than we can express. We're we're still in our series. I believe it's the third week of our series, Rubbing Shoulders with Each Other, where we talk about how, how does God, how does our faith and our relationship with God affect our relationships with each other as we're rubbing shoulders with each other. And as it fills up here, we're rubbing shoulders a lot with each other here this morning. Um, How does God um, affect our relationships with, with each other. And today's topic is we can enjoy each other. And some of you will go, oh, really? We can, yes, we can enjoy each other. Sometimes in relationships, I know for me it's easier to focus on the difficult parts of relationships, the, the crises, the conflict, and how difficult it can be to make relationships work. And actually, our original title for this passage or for this message from Colossians 3 actually was, We Can Put Up With Each Other. And, um, and it actually says it in here, you know, that we should bear with each other. But as Dave and I, Dave is speaking south today, as we were preparing for this, we thought, you know what, that's really, n- it doesn't seem to be the right title. It seems so negative. Yeah, we can, we can actually stand each other and put up with each other. But really, I think if we understand what what Paul is writing here in Colossians chapter 3, I think we will come away with the fact, with the knowledge that we can actually enjoy each other. And I'm going to give actually the conclusion of this message away at the beginning of this message, which they taught me in preaching class you should never do. (laughs) Um, But I'll do it anyway. You know why we can enjoy each other? We can enjoy each other because we are loved. We can enjoy each other because we are loved by God with an undescribable and immeasurable love. That's why you and I can enjoy being around each other. And that's what we're going to discover here in Colossians 3, verses 9 through 15. But before we dive into that, I would would just love to pray with you, if you would. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this morning. Father, the only reason we are here is because you love us. And you've loved us even when we wanted nothing to do with you. And I just thank you for that. Thank you for your immeasurable, unconditional, 
love for each and every one of us. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts this morning through your word and that you would show us how your love can affect our relationships with the people around us, the people that you've placed around us, the people that we're going through life with. So I just pray that, um, Lord, that you would take me and every other distraction out of the way, but that you would speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to set the context just a little bit for this, this passage um, here in Colossians 3. The whole point and purpose of Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing this letter to the church in Colossae is, is to correct a wrong understanding, some wrong theology that has crept into their church and into the teaching there. And the main thing that he's trying to correct is that he wants them to understand that, that living with Jesus, that following him has nothing to do with following a certain set of rules and regulations. Somehow, people, teachers in the church had started to, to teach that their religious traditions are the ones to keep, that, that how well we measure up to certain expectations and to their religious background and traditions is somehow a measure of true spirituality. And Paul's writing to them, basically saying, that is just not true. Your spirituality and your walk with Jesus has nothing to do and is not measured by you following a certain set of rules and regulations and human people's expectations on you. And I don't know, I hope you have a Bible with you. I actually want to encourage you um, to bring your Bible uh, to church on Sunday mornings to follow along. I know we, we always put it up on the screen, but it's, it's just great to have it with you and, and read it for yourselves. Um, if you open up to, to Colossians chapter 3, and if you read your Bible, you know, sometimes you will see that there's titles for certain sections. Now, I got to tell you, these titles were not in the original Bibles. These titles, like in chapter 2, there is a title here for, for a paragraph that says, Freedom from Human Regulations Through Life with Christ. That's a title that the editors of this translation of the Bible put in there so that the reader, you and me, can... Oh, okay, that's what this is about. But they are not the inspired Word of God, these titles. That's just some, that's something that an editor put in there. So I looked at this this week. I read all of Colossians kind of to, to really get the context for this. And so in chapter 2, we find this, this title, Freedom from Human Regulations Through Life with Christ, which is really why Paul is writing this, to tell them you are free from these regulations. So then I go to chapter 3, which is our text for this morning, and it says, Rules for Holy Living. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Freedom from Human Regulations, Rules for Holy Living. And I was thinking, man, that's something, that's just a little odd for me. And uh, it's just, I, I think I understand what they're saying. There are certain things that, that characterize a life that follows Jesus. But I think this title can give a wrong impression that holy living is actually accomplished by following rules. And that is not the case. Okay, so I just want you to know you have the freedom to, uh, to ignore chapter titles, all right, in, in the Bible. They are not part of the original manuscripts. But let's read the passage for today. It's in Colossians 3, and I want to start reading in verses 9 and then read through 15. Paul writes, Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, a really weird name, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. That is our, our passage for today. And what I want to do this morning with you is just walk through this passage together. Just go through it verse by verse and see how God's love, how through receiving and experiencing God's love, we can actually enjoy being with each other and, and doing life together. Last week, Dave talked 
on the passage right prior to that and talked about to, putting to death the earthly nature, putting, putting to death and, and leaving behind everything that goes contrary to God's will in your life and in my life. He talked about, I think, three points, confessing, receiving, and repenting, right? That we need to come to a point of understanding where our life goes contrary to God's will, confessing that, and then receiving His forgiveness and His love, and then repenting. And repenting really means to turn away from, to, to 180 degrees turn away from and walk away from. See, repenting isn't just stopping a certain behavior. Repenting means walking away from it and walking away from the circumstances that lead to that behavior. But walking away from something, I think, always, always means walking towards something else, right? If you turn away from something intentionally and you go somewhere else, you need something else to focus on. We walk away from something to walk towards something else and that's what we're going to talk about here this morning what are we walking towards and what are we looking towards and one thing i think that god is is telling us here in this passage he's he's telling us a few things that are true about us see when we walk away when we repent from something we almost always repent from believing a lie when we do things that are contrary to what God wants in our lives, it's because we believe a lie. We believe that doing that will bring fulfillment, that, that doing that will, will bring acceptance of some, some kind. We believe a lie. And repenting means turning away from that lie and walking towards truth. And in this passage, God tells us truth about ourselves. And it's really important for us to remember and to know and understand what is true about us from God's perspective. One thing that, that he says here, and this is a few things that I just want to repeat that Dave touched on last week, is that we have, if you have decided to follow Jesus, if you have decided to accept his forgiveness and to follow him, then you have already taken off your old self. You've already been given a new nature in Jesus. That is true about you. Whether you feel that at, a, at any given time, whether you, you always live and act that out, it is true about you. It is true about you. You are a new creation in Jesus. And that means that Jesus now, through the Holy Spirit, actually lives in you. That is, you know, as long as I've been a follower of Jesus, what, almost 20 years now, that is still just the concept of the Spirit of the Almighty God living in me and living in you. Doesn't that blow your mind? It blows my mind, but it is true. God says it over and over again in his word. That is true for you if you've started following him. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many, of you, uh, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you've been baptized in him, and it's not the act of baptism that does it. It's, it's the truth that's symbolized in baptism, the truth that you have put to death your old nature, that you have received forgiveness and that you have been given new life in him. That means you have Jesus. He lives in you. That is your identity. That is who you are. That's why he says here in verse 11, here, so he says, you're being renewed into the image of your creator, which means he's making you more and more into Jesus and into who he wants you to be. And then in verse 11, it says, here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. See, when, when you have started to follow Jesus and you have received his nature and his spirit, then that is who you are, then that is your identity, then that defines who you are more than anything else. If that is true, then it doesn't matter as much where you come from, whether you're Greek or Jew. Your, your origin doesn't define you anymore. Your ethnicity doesn't, doesn't define you anymore. The traditions, the religious traditions that you might have grown up with or not grown up with doesn't define you anymore. Your social status isn't what defines you. What defines you as a follower of Jesus is His Spirit living in you the new nature that he has given you, the new creature, the new creation, sorry, that he has made you. And then he promises in verse 10 that you will be renewed in the knowledge 
of your creator and, and will be renewed into his image. What I love about the way that is worded is it's, it's taking place right now. You are being renewed. It's taking place right now, but it's continuous. It will always go on. There is no end to that. He will continue and he's committed and faithful to be involved in your life to where He continuously shapes you and renews you and makes you more and more into the person that He created you to become. 2 Corinthians 3.18 describes it like this. It says, We are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory. That means as long as you are walking with Him through life, as you follow Him, more and more will He make you into the likeness of Jesus. And in, with ever-increasing glory means that likeness of Jesus will be more and more evident in your life to you and to the people around you. Another part that I love about how this is phrased is that it is passive. It is passive. You are being renewed. It's not something you are working up. It's not something you have worked hard and strive hard to accomplish. This is God's promise to you. He says, you follow me, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make you new, and I'm going to keep making you new, and I'm going to keep making you into the person that I created you to become. God does that. It's so often in Christian circles where it's all about what you do and what you achieve, and the more you do, the more spiritual you appear, and the more, more, more accepted you might be. You know, we always say, well, salvation is a free gift, but then once you've received it, we act like you've got to work really hard to keep it, and it's just not true. It is God's initiative to save us, and it is God's initiative to continue to work and shape our lives. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purposes. It is God who works it in you. So it says we're renewed in the knowledge of our Creator's image. And that knowledge is not, it is not talking about an, an academic, proper understanding of God. The knowledge that he's talking about that he wants us to grow in is an experiential, uh, um, intimate knowledge where we engage with him. Where we engage with him and allow God to engage with us. And submitting to the reality that we are new in him, that he is living in our lives. And so then in verses 11 through 15, there's three more things that God says are true about you and me if we are followers of Jesus. There's three things that I want to focus on here. And the first one you'll find right in the beginning of verse 12. Let me read that verse again. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. And then we have this whole list of things. I'll get into that later. But the first thing here that God says is true about you and me is that we are chosen by Him. We are chosen by God Almighty. Romans 8.33 says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies those He called, He justified. God has chosen you. Have you ever been chosen by another person? If you're married, you have obviously been chosen. I hope you haven't been promised by your parents or something like that. You've been chosen. Have you ever experienced not being chosen? Ever been, you know, in a setting, PE class or whatever, where you were supposed, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I see. I see. Experienced where, you know, there's these two captains and they pick their team and then you don't really get chosen, you get kind of left over and then say, okay, come here. That didn't feel great, did it? That did not feel great, did it? Really, not being chosen is, is almost identical to, nah, to being rejected. And oftentimes, our religious culture leads us to feel really rejected by God because we can't live up to certain standards, right? Well, that is not true in God's economy. God has chosen you. He has chosen you to be His child. In Ephesians, we, we find the picture of adoption being used for this. That God says, actually, I've adopted you as my child. 
Many of you might know that my, my wife and I, my family, we have adopted a little boy last November, little Kobe. And we chose him. We chose to adopt Kobe. We chose for Kobe to become my son. And in July, we had finalization in court with a, with a judge. It was a beautiful ceremony. And the judge looked at us <clears throat> towards the end when it came time to, you know, we had presented all the information and, and then it came time to actually sign the papers. He had already lived with us for six months, but this was it now. And the judge looked at us and says, before you sign this, I just need you to understand, Mr. and Mrs. Cockershite. Once you sign this, your choosing of Kobe is final. And there is nothing that can be done about that. There is no second guessing. There is no giving back. This is it. When you sign this, Kobe becomes your child just like your biological children, just like Clara, Casey, and Kenny. Kobe, you see the theme, K, 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 yeah, anyway. Kobe will become your child. And actually, we're waiting for the birth certificate to be sent to us from his state of where he was born. And you know what that birth certificate's going to say? It's going to say, Father Christian Kokoscheid, Mother Sandrine Kokoscheid. As if we conceived and birthed him. Well, not me, Sandrine. But <laughs> that, is, that is actually what takes place. The judge said, whoever had authority over him until now, that's done with. There is nothing left of that. He is 100% absolutely yours. He has the same rights and privileges as your other three. Do you understand that? We said, I think so. <laughs> and we signed, and, and he is ours. That is exactly what God does when we respond to him choosing us. Actually, the word that's used there, and yes, amen, you're right. The word that's used there in Ephesians for adoption, it literally means that the prior history is erased and it has become irrelevant. And then that again, that's what it means to be a new creation. We are new. The old is gone. God has chosen you to become all new. And you know what? It is all His initiative. It is His grace and His mercy. It's nothing that you or I have done or can do to deserve that, to come to the point where God says, all right, that's good enough. Now I choose you. None of that. It is absolutely from beginning to end His initiative and His grace. 1 Thessalonians 1.4 confirms that, it says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. And that's what I want to tell you this morning, brothers and sisters and Everybody here, God has chosen you. He has chosen you to be his child. And here's what's really crazy. When the judge said to us, Kobe will have the same rights and privileges as your, your children, your biological children. That is what the Bible tells us about our rights as his children. He says, we become co-heirs with who? With Jesus. We become God's children as Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean we can become saviors. That's a different... That's, that's, but in terms of what we receive from God, we have the same status as His Son, Jesus. We are co-heirs with Him. Does that blow your mind? It blows my mind. It's amazing. God has chosen you. The second thing that He tells us right after this, as God's chosen people, what is next? Holy. We are holy people if we are sons of God. You know, often we, holy is something that we only describe or ascribe to God. He is holy. You know, and, and uh, that's not something that we would ever, you know, <laughs> describe. That's not a word I would normally describe myself with. But you know what? God does. God says we are holy. You know what that really means? It doesn't mean we're perfect or infallible or anything like that. All that that means for us, when God says, I've made you holy, means He has taken us and He has set us apart and we are all His. He is holy and we are His children. So He has made us holy and set us apart for Him alone. We are holy. We are set apart for Him. We're chosen and we're holy. And the third one is really 
the key to all of this. The third one, the third truth that God proclaims about you and me is the key to understanding this whole, this whole passage. And it says we're dearly loved as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. See, it's because we are dearly loved. Because he loves us, is because that's why he's intimately involved in our lives and continuously wants to work in our lives and make us the people he created us to be. It's because he loves us so much that he's chosen us. It's because that he loves us so much that he set us apart for him. I think it's only if we understand or begin to understand his love that we can understand the rest of what, what it says here in this passage. And none of this, not the chosen, not the being holy, not the being loved, has anything to do again with what you or I do. I mean, I didn't read anything in here that says, you know, if you do this, then God will choose you, make you holy, and love you. No, He chose you. <laughs> he makes you holy, and He loves you. The rest of this passage, this list, needs to be understood in light of that. So here we go. Here's this list. Verse 17. Therefore, therefore, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over these, all these virtues, put on love. So there's kind of a shift taking place here. So far, it was all about what, what God has does for you out of love. He initiates. He loves you. He chooses you. He sets you apart. He loves you deeply. Now, do this, 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 this. Be humble. Be patient. Be gentle. Be kind. Love. Forgive. Bear with one another. I'm like, down. here's the list. <laughs> here are the rules. Right? That's what it feels like. But you see, there's a little word. And there's a little word. Whenever you come across this word when you read your Bible, which I hope you do, Watch out. You know what that word is? It says, therefore. <laughs> Very important word. You wouldn't think so. Therefore always means, okay, whoa, 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 wait, take a second. There's a connection here. What is he saying? He says, because of, because I have chosen you, because I have set you apart, because I love you so dearly, this should be in your life. What he's saying is, put on these things. That's, that's how, it's, how it's actually translated here. It says, clothe yourselves. And it's, again, we've got to remember that the Bible that we're reading is a translation. Anybody here speak a second language or third language? Have you ever translated something? It's really, I've, I used to do this quite a bit in Germany where American speakers would come in and I would translate their, their messages into German. And it's next to impossible to really pinpoint a translation to the T. It's really, really hard to do because there's so much cultural background and, and, and things that go into translation. Now, this word that's used here to translate clothes yourselves, which kind of sounds like, okay, we're taking this and we're putting this on so, that's, uh, so people can see this. That's, that's what it could sound like. But the word that's translated clothes yourselves here could also be translated as sinking into something. It could be translated as, as a marinating in something. All right? And it's really, I think the reason why they translated it, close yourselves, put this on, is because earlier in the passage it talked about putting off and putting on the new nature, right? But the, the real sense of this word is to, to sink into something, to, be, to soak something in and to marinate in it to the point where it becomes part of you. That's a little bit of a different picture, isn't it, than putting something on in your own effort. Yesterday, we had this cookout at Sugar House Park, and several of you I was very jealous of who brought Ziploc bags and Tupper boxes with steak just marinated and soaking in this yummy barbecue sauce, and my wife is vegetarian and didn't prepare any of that for me. <laughs> but you know what? So we took these steaks and we put them on the grill, and you could tell by the color of that steak, it had completely soaked in that marinade. It had become part of that steak, impossible to squeeze back out, right? That is the picture I want you to think of when we, when we read, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and so on. What he's saying, what Paul is, what Paul is not saying is, okay, work really hard at compassion, 
fake humility and pretend like you care. That is not what he's saying. He's not saying, come on, work this up. Come on, you can do this, buddy. Shape up, pull yourself together. What he's saying is, God chose you. He set you apart. He has a purpose for you. And he loves you. Sink into that. Soak that in. Marinate in that love that God has for you. Let that love so permeate your life that it becomes part of your being. And if it does, these things will seep out of your love, out of your life. It will be a result of soaking in and understanding and engaging in God's love for you. You know, we soak in things all the time, don't we? We soak in things as we live. And, and the things that we soak in, that we allow to become part of our being, will inevitably do what? Work their way back out, right? They will be evident to the people that we engage with on a regular basis. If you soak in Sports Center every morning, which there's nothing inherently wrong with that, I just want to make that very clear. But if we soak in Sports Center for a couple of hours and two more reruns every morning, <laughs> I'm not speaking from experience here, but if we were to do that, we soak that in, what will it do? It will seep back out in our conversations. People will know that dude loves Sports Center, right? If, we, if, if our children soak in violence through what they watch and what they play, it will inevitably work itself out in their lives. If we as a culture soak in immorality in our entertainment, guess what our lives will reflect? Immorality. So the question is, how, how do we soak in God's love? How does that work? Another, another word that, that um, this clothing in can be translated, and actually the Greek word, by the way, is enduo, that is translated clothing yourselves with or, or soaking in. And that's where we get our word endow from. And what that word means, the, the, the English word endu or endow is to endow somebody with an ability or quality, which is another great picture of this soaking in. By soaking in God's love, this word says, we will be given these qualities. They will be given to us, abilities and qualities. And that is what takes place when you and I Soak in Jesus and soak and marinate in his love. The Bible tells us very clearly if we do that, these qualities will be produced in our lives. And these qualities will be evident in our lives and they will affect our relationships to the point where we can really enjoy being with each other. Tell me, don't you want to be around people that are kind, that are humble, that are gentle, that are patient, that are forgiving and loving and bearing with you, not just putting up with you, but bearing your burdens with you? Who wants to be around people like that? I do. So how do we do that? How, how do we soak that in? I think that a better question is, first, before we ask how is why. Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to do that? I'm, I'm going to make a confession here right now. Right now, I'm soaking in some stuff. Right now, I'm soaking in college football. Anybody else here soaking in college football right now? Nothing inherently wrong with that. It's all a question of priorities and proportions. But right now, I'm really enjoying the beginning of college football season in my Gamecocks, my South Carolina Gamecocks won this weekend, right? There we go. But you know what I do to soak in that right now? I read Sports Illustrated and ESPN.com sometimes. I read, I read about it because I want to know about it. I, I listen to so-called experts on sports radio who pretend they know more than me. But I listen to those guys, see what they have to say. They've got inside scoops that I don't have. Another thing is I hang out with other football lovers. Man, there's always an open invitation when the Gamecocks play, my house. I, I, I surround myself with other people that love football, and we talk about it. And then I watch games. I watch games because I love it. So the reason why right now I'm allowing myself to soak in some college football is because I love it and because I have an interest in it. So why, 
Why would we soak in Jesus? Why would we soak in his love? Hopefully it's because we love him. Hopefully it's because we have a deep interest in knowing more about him and knowing him more personally. So just as I went through the list of how I soak in college football right now, the reason I did this is because it's practical and it really doesn't look any different than how we can soak in Jesus and soak in his love. We can read about it. It's so easy for me to pick up a Sports Illustrated and just go through and just absorb that information. Somehow, at times, it's harder, isn't it, to pick up the Bible and read and soak that in. But that's part of it, part of soaking in Jesus and soaking and marinating in his love for you is, is, is reading. Learn more about him. And there's other great books uh, about him that, that we can read about scriptural, biblical topics that are good for us. Some of them we have here in, in the bookstore um, that, you can, that you can get there and just soak in that information. Another way I soak in college football is listening. It's another way we can soak in Jesus is listening. You're doing it right now. But there's a lot better people to listen to than me. There's countless podcasts that we can download from much better speaker than, than we are here. There's countless stuff that we can go and, and get. One, one way that I try and soak in God's word is I, I have these um, to the MP3s, the Bible experience. They're a dramatic reading of, of scripture and they're awesome to listen to. Most of the time when I'm driving in the car, it's kind of downtime, nothing's really happening. I pop that in and I just listen. Just listen to God's word and allow it to soak into my heart. Another way I soak in college football is hanging out with other football lovers. And we talk about this here all the time. A, a really important part of you experiencing Jesus and experiencing his love is by hanging out with other people who love him. That's why Life Together groups are so important for us here because, because we, we realize that we need to surround ourselves with other people who are on the same journey than we are different experiences that we can learn from and we can encourage each other in. And I just want to encourage you again today, if, if you are not in, in community with other people here, you're missing out. You're missing out on an important part of experiencing Jesus and you're missing out on an important part of soaking in His love and allowing Him to penetrate your life. So we have Life Together groups, we have K2U on Wednesday nights where we have smaller groups that really dig into God's Word. Um, Wednesday nights at 7 here on campus, that's going to start up again in a couple of weeks and we'll let you know the details. But those are all opportunities for you to hang out with others and really soak in God. And then we can watch, we can watch and learn from those around us. Watch and learn from those that, are, that have gone before us. Watch and learn from their experience with Jesus. And I, I can guarantee you, I can guarantee it because God guarantees it, that if we, if we take these initiatives, He promises that He will work these things in our lives. So is there something we need to do? Yeah, there is something we need to do, and that is we need to engage. We need to engage. The rest is up to God. Can you imagine, can you seriously imagine what this community would be like, what K2 would be like, what your small group would be like, if all of us individually would really make it our mission to soak in God's love, to marinate in it, to where it penetrates our lives, where these characteristics, where kindness and compassion, humility, gentleness, patience, love, forgiveness, become part of our nature that is inseparable from us, that is evident and works itself out in the way that we relate to each other? Can you imagine what this community would look like? Can you imagine what it would look like to people on the outside and how much people would want to be part of a community like that, that actually lives like that, that is so penetrated by the love of Jesus? There's really nothing that we want more for K2. I want to close this by going to verse 15. 
But he kind of wraps this up and says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. You know, the times when I experience the biggest sense of peace is when I have a really deep sense of who I am and my identity in Jesus. When I know, not just up here, but in my heart, when I know I've been chosen, I've been set apart, and I'm deeply loved by God. When I know that, when I know that is what defines me, everything else kind of fades into the background. That's when I experience most peace, when I really know who I am. And on the flip side of that, isn't it true that we, we experience in our own lives the, the biggest lack of peace when we're just kind of, not, not, we just don't know where we are and who we belong to and, and, and who God made us and we're just kind of figuring this out. Ever been a teenager? <laughs> Ever b been around a teenager recently? You know, the age when they just kind of, they just don't know. Well, who am I and who am I becoming? Am I boy or man or girl or woman? And, and what's really going on? And oh, there's a lot of lack of peace, let's just say, in, in those life stages, isn't there? See, and that is what he's talking about. If you know who you are in Jesus, if you know you're chosen, you're set apart, and you're loved, when these characteristics are worked out through Jesus in your life, that will bring peace to your life. And that's why he says, let that peace rule in your hearts. Let that be the guiding factor in your life. That word for ruling here is a word that they would have used for an umpire back then or a referee at their athletic events. And I, it just gave me the picture, you know, as I played a lot of soccer and so often in a game there are situations where there is a, a, a call, he makes a call, you've just taken a tackle or something, two guys on the ground, and both look at the referee just like, and just waiting, you know, or, or, or like a, a hitter in, in, in baseball and the catcher, you know, the a pitch comes in and both of them like, what is it? And you wait for him to make the call. This is it. That's, that's what it's talking about here. Let that peace, let that knowledge of who you are in Jesus guide your decisions. When there's ambiguity, you go, okay, I'm loved by you. I can react kind. I don't need to defend myself right now. I don't need to be defensive. I can be kind. I can forgive rather than hold grudges. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. But to live in that peace, we have to know that peace. And that peace only comes from us responding to the love that Jesus offers. It's all his initiative, but he won't force it on you or on me. We can only live in that peace if we experience that peace by responding to his love and his offer of forgiveness by saying, yes, I need and I want your forgiveness and I want to receive your love because that's really what we're made for is to receive his love and forgiveness in our lives comes from responding to Jesus who says to you today Jesus is telling you today I choose you I set you apart from me and I love you deeply what's your response to that what's your response to that as the band comes up I want to close and just say you know what it says on here we are loved that's really what it comes down to that's that's the message of the Bible in one to three words. We are loved. You are loved by God. What it comes down to is your response to that. What do you say this morning to the fact that Jesus chooses you, sets you apart and loves you? Do you say, hey, thanks, but no thanks. I'm good. I can do this. Or do you want to say, you know what, I, uh, I want to say yes to that today. I have this deep, deep longing to receive this unconditional, immeasurable love that you offer. I want to be chosen by you. And I want to respond to that. And I want to soak in your love. I want your love to become part of who I am so that it affects the relationships that you have placed in my life. 
and that it affects the relationships with the people you do life with. So you look around here, you see the clothesline on the side. It's not that uh, my wife couldn't do laundry at home this week. Those are shirts, as you see, they have these uh, characteristics on there that God wants to work in our lives as we soak in His love. You know, part of that is that God wants to show His love to people around you through you. God might want to show His compassion for people through you at times, His forgiveness through you, His gentleness and kindness and humility. And so I just want you, as we sing these songs now, to, to just maybe, or even right now before we sing, just sing and pray quickly and say, God, I want to soak in your love. I want to soak that in so that I can be an agent of your love to others around me. And would you just ask him to bring to mind people in your life who right now might be in the need of one of those through you? Would you just ask him, God, who in my life needs my forgiveness right now? Who in my life, in my workplace, in my family needs, needs kindness right now? Where, where do I need to show humility? And then I just want to invite you, as we sing, to walk over to the side and either write that person's name on that shirt as your commitment to say, I'm going to soak into Jesus to have him give me the love, forgiveness, compassion, kindness that he wants to show to that person. And you don't have to write the name. You know, if you need to forgive your wife and she's with you up here, you don't need to. But you can, you can, uh, you can just write neighbor, coworker, boss, pastor, it doesn't have to be a name, but it's your commitment to saying, okay, I really want to dig into Jesus. I want him to provide what he wants me to give to these people. Would you do that during these songs? Let's worship together. Thank you.